Hi, this is Stacy Chilemi from The Advisor. And today I have a very special guest and his name is Colby Kosh. And he is here to discuss about autoimmune disease and ways to improve your health. And he's going to uh, tell us a little about himself and what he does. So take it away, Colby. Hello, Stacy, and hello to the, the listeners. I'm zooming in from Basel, Switzerland. I'm currently at a healthcare conference. Um, my background is in health and wellness. I studied physiology at the University of Florida's College of uh, Health and Human Performance. I then went on to chiropractic school where I uh, studied uh, clinical nutrition, got a, a master's in clinical nutrition, and uh, also went on to study functional medicine and really developed uh, quite the passion for uh, the human body and everything we can do to not only support our health, but also potentially um, reverse some of the inflammatory symptoms that we experience in, in the modern world. And so I went into clinical practice for a short period of time before taking a pivot into healthcare technologies where we finance the development of uh, different therapeutics that could um, help uh, individuals with with their health issues. And I'm, I'm a big believer that you need both uh, the holistic approach and the modern conventional approach for the best mm -hmm. outcomes for patients where you, you Stacey, you often get like one, you're on one team or the other. I really think uh, it's, it's it lies somewhere in the middle is yes. the most uh, successful approach. I actually know of quite a few doctors now that are actually kind of in the middle. They're realizing that you can't just always rely on conventional medicine. And, you know, it has to be, uh, you know, using a combination of both actually works wonders because you can't expect just to pop a pill and feel good. And then you're you and you utilizing a an unhealthy lifestyle. And then you're saying, well, I don't feel any better, doc. You know, maybe you can give me something else, you know, and people don't realize it's not just about popping a pill. It's about, you know, you can take the medication because you need a little bit more than just the holistic, you know, health, you know, side, but you also have to change your lifestyle. And you're a big fan about nutrition, you had mentioned. Can you explain why nutrition is so important, especially when you're suffering from autoimmune and digestive issues and so forth? Yeah. yeah. And, and you bring up a good point. I, I wish you could just take a, a magic pill and all your issues would go away. But I said that there's no such thing as a free metabolic lunch. Yes. <laughs> and, and so you, you really got to try the true evidence uh, based path is combining everything uh, that's out there in the literature. And so, yeah, I, I mean, uh, I like to look at health through an evolutionary lens. Our species has been around um, for 100,000 generations. Yeah. And during most of that history, we, we survived and lived as hunter-gatherers, uh, where pr we predominantly consumed animal-based foods and then about 10,000 years ago, uh, likely due to overhunting uh, of megafauna, uh, we were probably forced into agriculture, which is known as the, the Neolithic Revolution and also perhaps maybe the, the, one of the biggest mistakes in, in human history, um, where we shifted from more of a animal-based diet into a, uh, agriculture of grains. We could feed more mouths, uh, but humans lost a lot of our health. And we know this from the archaeological record where we began getting dental carriers, bone infections, we shrunk in height, our brain shrunk, and the list goes on. And even in modern times, there's dozens of examples around the world of, of hunter-gatherer tribes where we could study that they have really non-existent rates of autoimmune disease, allergies, and asthma until highways are built up to their ancestral lands. And within a generation, they get uh, just as sick as we do. And I think for the listeners, some of the, the best documentation of this out there is by the, the name of a, a dentist in the 1940s, Dr. Weston A. Price, um, who saw, uh, you know, w travel all over the world really to study dentition. 
mm-hmm. of native tribes. He went to the Eskimos in Alaska, the Aboriginals in Australia, the Native Americans, African tribes. And what he found was uh, cavities didn't really exist after tens of thousands of examinations. And they also all had perfect uh, jaw structure, which was interesting. And within one generation um, uh, of the, the food being imported, and adults that had grown up with a a, a a traditional diet, but were exposed to these processed foods in adulthood, they rem- they had perfect jaw structures, but their teeth started to rot out of their mouths. But then the next generation that grew up with the processed foods, they had all sorts of jaw malformations. And the reason why I bring that up is because it gets to the root of the issue of what's going on when we consume processed foods. Well, we have an altered microbiome in our gut. The yes. microbiome is the bacteria that live within us. And there's likely more bacteria than there are human cells. And so when we get a shift in the populations of bacteria in our gut, they produce um, neurochemicals and, and, and chemical signals that attach to every receptor on every cell in your body. And they have the ability to turn genes on and off. And so what happens when you consume um, processed foods and you get a shift of of the bad bacteria, it causes a little bit of inflammation in the gut lining that's uh, been coined leaky gut, where yes. the, the gap junctions in the gut get a little bit bigger and then molecules slip through that wouldn't normally be able to slip through right. and cause a, a heightened immune response in the body that could take form as allergies or asthma and you become a nasal breather, excuse me, a mouth breather because your nasal passage is is clogged and then your jaw doesn't uh, develop properly and you get issues, you become a, a mouth breather, your your palate's too small and the teeth come in all jaggered. Yeah. Um, not to mention being a mouth breather, the the or, your oral microbiome shifts negatively and that causes a, a bad breath. Bad breath. So that that is sort of um, the de- you know. How, when I look about diet through an evolutionary lens of the the, the history of, of how we are, got where we are now. And I'm happy to answer more specific questions regarding that. Now, when a person, you know, has all those symptoms that you mentioned, because so many people suffer, you know, with the problem of snoring, not being able to breathe, sleep apnea, you know, um, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, they, they say is not is related gut wise, you know, um, what do you suggest? First of all, when a person has, um, what we call the leaky gut or they have, you know, all these different, um, you know, diseases and conditions related to the autoimmune system, how does a person start to create a healthy lifestyle so they can start to see positive changes? Because a lot of times people think, oh, I'm just not eating the right thing. And then they go on to these fad diets and nothing's changing, or they lose a little weight or they lose an abundance of weight, but their body's not getting better. They're still, you know, and they go, you know, eventually either they go back to their old ways or the body is losing weight, but it's not ac- actually healthier. You know, it'll be healthier maybe for a short period of time, but it's not, the body isn't where it should be. So what do you, how do you suggest to somebody, you know, who really, you know, sees the signs, but wants to, you know, wants to change, but they don't know the right structural way to do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy you, you brought up the example of, of, even people losing weight, but they're they're not getting healthier. And I, I never view diet through the lens of weight loss because when one consumes uh, an ever, evolutionary consistent diet, our hormones for hunger and satiety uh, come back to homeostasis. So you get hungry when you're supposed to be hungry, and then you're full when you're supposed to be full because you're eating satiating foods and the weight comes off on its own, but look at someone with uh, perhaps Crohn's disease where they're not absorbing any food and they're constantly losing weight and their immune system is spiraling out of control. Right. The first step is to find out what foods might be triggering uh, you as an individual. And I want to uh, specify you because uh, a superfood for you might be triggering to me. It's a really a very individualized process. So the, the first step is eliminating the, the lowest hanging fruit, which would be processed foods, mm-hmm. uh, foods that are packaged and made in factories. And 
and you could uh, uh, to take it at, as far as getting rid of uh, gluten and dairy, which tend to be the more provocative foods for a lot of people. Not to say that it's for everyone, but at least for, for most people, that's going to be the first step. And then after you get the, rid of the processed foods and and some of the the uh, uh, gluten and, and dairy, you can take a step further, get rid of uh, uh, most grains and take a look at different plant foods that might be triggering because over the course of evolution, plants are organisms that don't want to be eaten necessarily. They want to pass on their genetics. Right. And so over time, they've created uh, defense mechanisms to prevent animals from consuming too much of them. That's why you see a lot of herbivores graze and they don't eat too much of one plant. And you look around nature, 99% of plants, if we consumed it, we would get very sick, right? if not die. And most of the plant foods we consume today have been domesticated in the last 10,000 years yes. to be a, a little bit less toxic. But with that being said, gluten, which is very infamous, that is a plant, that's a one good example of a plant defense toxin. And there's uh, gluten is a, a type of lectin, mm -hmm. and lectins tend to be uh, quite high in a class of vegetables called nightshades. Yes. And so uh, nightshades include tomatoes, eggplant, and potatoes. And so that's just one example, eliminating the nightshade uh, a family. Then you could look to another class of, of plant toxins called uh, oxalates which could be high in uh, dark chocolate, some of the nuts and some of the, some of the leafy greens. And yes. uh, it, it could be a lot to eliminate everything at once. That's why, uh, you know, I think you could do it in steps until you get more and more restrictive, hopefully with the intention that one day uh, you're able to bring some of that back in and have uh, more options in your diet. But you have to be willing to be very, uh, restrictive and dedicated to gain your health back because your, your doctor can't heal you. Your mother can't heal you. It has to be you. You're the CEO of your health and you could use all these um, other people as part of the team to help you get there. So, and then there's also meal timing. Uh, we humans weren't, uh, we didn't always have access to 24 seven food. Yes. It was more of a, a, a feast famine cycle. So Many people are familiar with intermittent fasting, whereby you abstain from food for a minimum of 12 hours. So if you consume your last meal at 8 p.m., you don't con uh, consume food again until 8 a.m. And then you could build from there to, to 16 hours, 18 hours. And then anything below 24 hours is considered intermittent. And anything above 24 hours is uh, more in the range of prolonged fasting. But the the benefits of intermittent fasting include giving your digestive system a little bit of a rest right. uh, and you see a positive shift in the microbiome that we talked about before to so more of the po uh, the positive um, bacteria that produce anti-inflammatory signals to your body you get a boost in human growth hormone and a decrease in ghrelin the the hunger hormone over time so you begin to consume less now, anything above 24 hours is a different range, and you could go 24 hours to a couple of days to even uh, a week, and it's not for everyone, and there's some uh, risks for certain populations to take part in prolonged intermittent fasting or prolonged fasting, but some of the benefits that, uh, well, first I'll start with... Uh, uh, Dr. Walter Longo, uh, he's a longevity researcher, and he did experiments on animals whereby when they go through these prolonged fasts, the body begins to digest down its own cells in a process called cellular autophagy, mm -hmm. which literally means self-eating. But it doesn't just break down any cells in the body. It breaks down first the old dysfunctional cells, the hyperactive white blood cells that are responsible for autoimmune disease, the cancerous cells. And at the same point in time that you're getting this, this breakdown of the, the, the harmful cells, you're getting a huge upregulation in stem cell production, which is like the young, naive cells. So you get, yes. you get sort of a detoxification uh, a process that goes on. And in the animal models, they even saw a regeneration in the insulin-producing cells 
uh, in the pancreas. So it reversed type one uh, diabetes in animals, which was very interesting. So I know for myself, I didn't start in the, I forgot to mention this in the intro as some, uh, someone that had Crohn's disease and inflammatory arthritis and psoriasis, uh, prolonged fasting, intermittent fasting was really something that I don't think I, if I did not incorporate that, it, it would have been very hard to get my symptoms under management. Now, how does a person start with intermediate fasting? Like what would be step one? You know, how would people begin? Because sometimes people go to the extreme. They read a few articles on the internet and then they jump right into it. Should it be gradual or should they do certain things? Like maybe the first couple of days, then maybe something the next couple of days, or is there like a specific type of schedule? So your body adjusts to a change from going from lots of foods or processed foods or whatever the their diet is to actually going into intermediate fasting. Is there a safe way to do it so a person can kind of go into it and actually have some positive, healthy results from it? You know, one of the things that individuals with autoimmune disease need to be cognizant of is their stress load. Mm -hmm. Chronic stress is a bad thing that uh, overwhelms the body over time. And acute stress is generally a good thing, meaning a, a short intermittent bout of stress. So think exercise. It's a stress on the body, but you come back and you build stronger. No different than fasting. Fasting is a little bit of a stress on the body. And in response to stress, your body produces uh, internal antioxidants. Your brain produces something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is like um, fertilizer for your neurons and your liver produces some other antioxidants and it's a, it could be a good thing. But if you do too much at uh, initially, you, you, it's too high of a dose. It could be, it could lead to chronic stress if you do too much of it in the early days. So yeah, Stacy, you bring up a very good point that it should be gradual. You start with just 12 hours. And you see how you respond to it. And if you stay consistent and you build up over time, you'll realize uh, six months down the down the road, you can't believe you ever lived uh, another way. And you used to consume all the time because it's so foreign. It's like icky. It's so foreign to you that you feel so much better now uh, doing it this way. Right. Uh, so, so it's something to definitely be built up over time. And what some people find is that, uh, and this is a whole nother rabbit hole, so I won't jump into it just yet, yeah. but if they if they become keto adaptive and they play around with the keto diet, that actually makes them a little bit more adapted to prolonged, prolonged fasting. As mm -hmm. when you go into prolonged fast, your body's using predominantly uh, ketones and simple fats as fuel rather than stored sugar that your your liver ultimately runs out of during a fast. Right. Now, you know, I, I notice even when I cut out sugar out of my diet, you know, I, I noticed a change. It's kind of first I went through like a withdrawal, but then once I, I started to cut sugar out of my diet, I felt so much better. And if I taste something that has a high content of sugar, let's say if I go out with friends and they have pastries, I don't like it anymore. And it's like, I noticed the change and your body becomes sensitive to it. Just like, I feel like, you know, when I stopped, you know, eating a lot of meat, when I would eat meat, it would lay very heavy on my stomach, you know, cause your body gets used to digesting and not having to work so hard. I think sometimes that when it does have to work hard, your body feels it and it puts stress on the body. Is, is that's true? Yeah. I, I think there's a couple different routes for that. Number one, when you consume a lot of sugar, you're feeding the bacteria in the gut that that live on that sugar. And so they produce chemical signals that might reinforce the cravings for that same food. No different than your brain um, craves some of the, the different um, chemicals that the bacteria produce or the the chemicals that your body produces after you consume a food like that. So it's also wired into your brain to, yeah. to seek after that. So you have to literally break and have cell death of the neuro circuits in your brain to yeah. get over that addiction right. of, of those certain food groups. So it's a, it's a uphill battle. And that's why 
habit formation is such an important part of this conversation is are you setting yourself up to win or you're setting yourself up to lose? Is it in the pantry yes. and at your darkest moment, moment late at <laughs> night, you're going to lose to convenience. You have to set it up in such a way, you know, you tell your friends what you're doing. You have a, a food journal right. and affirmations and you meal prep. So in the, in the crazy uh, busy days during the week, you, you, you don't uh, lose to convenience. And that's, that's a major part of this. I think you brought up a good point too, is I like the food journal because I would always suffer from inflammation. My weight, my water weight would go up and down, up and down. And then I started to keep a food journal and I started to try to, you know, calculate when was the retention of water occurring. And it helped me understand what my body was sensitive to and what was actually triggering the inflammation in, in my body. So I think a food journal is really beneficial for people, especially when they're trying to improve their health. How do you feel about food journals and who should use food journals especially? I think I, I, I you know, view uh, most of everything I talk about through uh, an autoimmune lens. So I'd say, yeah, of course, uh, individuals with autoimmune disease should use a food journal. So they're they're documenting what they ate, what they eliminated and how that correlates to their their symptoms and uh same goes for for people that are trying to lose weight or that they have their own goals etc um so the i'll go back to the beginning because uh when we talked about the the microbiome how uh, leaky gut kind of leads to this heightened immune response mm -hmm. and so if you're consuming foods that uh, lead to inflammation in the gut and they're causing this overgrowth of bacteria that then cascade in producing neurochemicals that attach to every cell in the body. So if you have multiple sclerosis and it's affecting the nervous system, if you have uh, a thyroid autoimmunity, if you have uh, skin inflammation, your acute flares could be um, very closely tied to what you're consuming. And so this way you begin to document what is pissing off your specific immune system. And, you know, we have short-term memories sometimes, you know, what did you eat yesterday for lunch? Right. What did you, you know, it, it's hard to remember. So you almost go back into the log and you begin to get these data points that you're able to, to tie things together because it's hard to have a working memory, um, especially over a couple of weeks, a couple of months, six months, a year. And you'll, it's, it's kind of, uh, time consuming, but if you, if it's, if it's important enough to you, it could be a big help when you, when you look, you got to treat it like it's a, a science project. Right. Right. I think, you know, um, how do you feel about, um, probiotics and prebiotics? Because a lot of times when people are suffering, um, from, uh, leaky gut syndrome, or they have digestive issues and they have more bad bacteria, you know, instead of having more good bacteria, the balance of, of using probiotics or prebiotics and, and balancing yourself and, and maybe having, um, you know, a lot of times they sell different types of products that have the probiotics in it and also have the nutrients of vegetables, certain vegetables, red and green vegetables. How do you feel about that? So uh, the the greatest uh, supporting evidence for, for probiotics and prebiotics is really consuming fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha. Mm -hmm. is when when you consume those foods it's a mix of of all the good stuff and so probiotics are are the actual bacteria mm -hmm. prebiotics are the food that feed the bacteria and then you get things called postbiotics which are the excretions of of the good bacteria and also the bad bacteria and those could be food for the cells of your colon or messages to different cells in your body and so you're really getting all in one um, with fermented foods. Now, the research with probiotics shows it may be beneficial, but it doesn't really seed the gut. It's not, okay. but it, it's kind of the, the excretions that it's producing as it goes through the system that is beneficial. Um, it's very individualized. I know some probiotics are better for constipation. Some are better for diarrhea. 
And the same goes for different types of postbiotics. So it's something to think about is creating a list of the different probiotics and prebiotics that exist out there and incorporating it with your food journal as you, as you try them out. Now, tell me a little bit about the book that you uh, published in January. Um, what's it called? And tell tell our audience what it's about. So, you know, people could actually see if this is something that actually could help them and maybe go to the store where you, they sell it and, and buy it. So the name of the book is The Autoimmune Plague, How to Regain uh, Health and Sovereignty Over Your Body for So Many People autoimmune disease is debilitating and puts a dampener on what you could do in life. Um, for example, individuals with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, 10 years after diagnosis, up to 50% can, can no longer work. And not to mention Crohn patients uh, have to worry about where the closest bathroom is uh, when, when they're traveling and that could perturb them from traveling at all. So the book is really about um, what you could do uh, from a holistic viewpoint to help your immune system fall back into homeostasis and unleash the change hold, uh, holding you back while also in conjunction with your, your healthcare provider. But it's likely a lot of information you probably won't get from them. Uh, I certainly didn't. And there's about over 500 uh, scientific references throughout the book. So there's one chapter on nutrition and elimination diet. There's another chapter on the microbiome, how to create a harmonious environment in your gut. I go and I, I talk about fasting, exercise, other modalities like sauna and cold thermogenesis, and, and also some experimental stuff that may not have as much evidence backing it. But if, you, if you're in a very dark place with your autoimmune disease, you want all the options yeah. uh, at your disposal of what you could try. Because for some some people, it, it it's a deteriorating condition until they die. That, yeah. is, the, that is the state of, of certain, some certain autoimmune diseases. And so I think it could be used as a manual for patients as a trial and error along with their, their symptom or food journal. And it seems too that it also could help educate people who may, that may not have an autoimmune disease, but they have an idea how they could actually change their living so they don't occur maybe conditions. Because even a functional medicine doctor, they'll do a lot of blood work, they'll watch you, and they'll they help you, you know, prevent certain things from occurring before it actually happens. So maybe something like your book could actually benefit more than a specific niche that you focused on, because it seems like the book has a lot of great information to actually help people to learn how to live healthy and how to eat healthy. So none of these things occur to them in the future. Sooner or later, uh, your health will be the most important thing to you. Yes. So uh, I agree. It's it's a lot easier to prevent the disease than to then try and go in remission from it. Yes. So it's I always say for myself, it's like a blessing in disguise that I had to deal with this stuff uh, younger because it, it created the awareness and the ha habits now when it's much easier when you're younger to create these lifelong habits. And so it, it's it's something people should educate. They should have basic education on health, just like they would finance or, or other aspects of life. And they they would definitely gain uh, a, a lot and prevent hardship down the road. Now, where can we find your book? So it's on Amazon, mm -hmm. Autoimmune Plague. You type it in. And it's also at Barnes & Noble and a couple other outlets. If you look it up on Google, it'll pop up. That's awesome. And what is your website? If people want to go on your website to learn a little bit more about you and the things you do. The website is the autoimmuneplague.com or autoimmuneplague.com. And you, it, it, the, it so, gives the first chapter um, as a sample. Oh, excellent. And do you have a blog as well? Uh, I don't currently have a blog, but I, I've done a couple articles here and there over the years. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So people could look you up on Google and find out 
more information, you know, that you, you, cause the, the information you provided today was outstanding. And I, I'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, Dr. Colby, you've been an amazing guest and the information that you provided, I think is very beneficial because this is something I think a lot of people in our society, especially in the United States alone, suffer from, you know, um, there's so many different illnesses related to the autoimmune, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and suffer, they, people suffer from different types of autoimmune diseases. And this is something I think a large majority of people need to be well educated on because as much as we talk about it, people don't realize the severity of actually eating these processed foods and, you know, the damage it's actually doing to our bodies. So today you've made a lot of great points of how dangerous processed foods are and how people could actually readjust their lifestyle and actually help improve their health. So this has been a great experience for me. And I'd love to have you back on the show. Oh, thank you very much, Stacy, for having me. And it'd be a, a great pleasure to, to come back on. Well, thank you so much for, you know, coming on the show. And I really enjoyed this and, you know, have a great day. I thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. Same to you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too.